Of all the Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th Amendment has had the biggest impact. It followed the pattern begun by the 13th Amendment, by creating new rights, requiring the states to respect these rights, and creating new powers for the federal government. Its scope, however, was broader than the 13th Amendment. This broader scope was necessary because experience after the Civil War had shown that the elimination of slavery had not ended the legal subordination of the formerly enslaved population. Almost as soon as slavery ended, former slave states enacted highly discriminatory laws known as the Black Codes that would apply only to the black population. The 14th Amendment sought to ensure that the newly freed slaves would not be permanently made into second-class citizens. The 14th Amendment can best be summarized in three portions. Section 1 created new rights that state governments had to respect. Section 5 gave Congress new powers to enforce those new rights. Sections 2, 3, and 4 were primarily designed to deal with the readmission of the former Confederate states back into the Union. While portions of these sections have some continuing effects, by and large they have become less important over time. Section 1 is the main rights-creating portion of the 14th Amendment. Its first sentence declares that all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. are both United States citizens and state citizens. You may be wondering why state citizenship is mentioned here at all. Shouldn't that be left to the state constitutions? The answer lies in the Dred Scott decision. As you will remember, the first of that decision's two holdings was that African slaves and all their descendants were not U.S. citizens and not citizens of states, as that term was used in the Diversity of Citizenship Clause of Article 3. The Birthright Citizenship Clause put the last nail into the coffin of the Dred Scott decision. The second sentence of Section 1 required the states to respect three categories of individual rights. The first of these involves the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. This language may seem familiar to you because a portion of the original Constitution from 1787 said that states needed to give citizens of other states the same privileges and immunities as their own citizens enjoyed. Now, potentially, there may have been some parallels to draw between the older Article IV Privileges and Immunities Clause and this new 14th Amendment Privileges or Immunities Clause. However, a series of Supreme Court decisions has rendered the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment pretty unimportant. In the 1870s, just a few years after the 14th Amendment was ratified, the Supreme Court held that almost nothing would count as a privilege or immunity that was protected by the new Privileges or Immunities Clause. For example, the clause would not require the states to honor any of these rights. The right to operate a private slaughtering business. The right to practice law. The right to vote or virtually any of the rights described in the Bill of Rights, including the right to peacefully assemble and the right to keep and bear arms. Now, the logic of these decisions is beyond the scope of this video. The short version, however, is that the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment has not played any significant role in modern constitutional law. By contrast, the next two clauses in Section 1 have had a huge impact on today's constitutional law. The first of these is the Due Process Clause, which limits the ways in which a state might deprive people of life, liberty, or property. Once again, this language will seem familiar because a virtually identical Due Process Clause was part of the Fifth Amendment, which was ratified in 1791. Now, the difference is that the Fifth Amendment said that the federal government must respect due process rights. The Fourteenth Amendment imposed that obligation on the states. And because states did much more legislating at this time, extending it to the states had a much greater impact than the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause ever had. Finally, Section 1 announced a right that was genuinely brand new, the right to the equal protection of the laws. This language was not found in any earlier part of the Constitution. 
The Declaration of Independence from 1776 said that all men are created equal, but the Constitution itself had never before included the word equal. But after the 14th Amendment, equality was an explicit constitutional value. One major difference between the Reconstruction Amendments and the previously enacted portions of the Bill of Rights was its explicit application to state governments. Before the Reconstruction Amendments, states only needed to respect those individual rights found in state constitutions. Now the U.S. Constitution required states to respect certain federally protected individual rights. This diagram symbolizes how the new rights created by Section 1 of the 14th Amendment imposed a new set of limits on how states could exercise their sovereign powers. Like the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment also created a new federal power to enact laws to enforce the individual rights created elsewhere in the amendment. This diagram illustrates how the new federal power expanded the authority of Congress and potentially reduced the authority of states. First, as we've seen, Section 5 created a new enumerated power, expanding the scope of Congress's enumerated powers. As with all laws passed by Congress, these laws would be supreme, and this meant that states were now limited in their ability to enact conflicting laws.